Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Rami Heed. Today, we are presenting a progressive cavity pump presented by Mr. Ayman Allah. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. I'll, I, I'll bring them <clears throat> up during the presentation, and we will also have the time for questions at the end. We will turn the time over uh, to Mr. Alam. Our presenter today is expert in oil and gas development uh, and production, with more than 12 years of experience in oil sector. Mr. Alam is a senior petroleum engineer. <coughs> uh, sorry. Uh, he has a BSc degree in petroleum engineering from Seoul University. Currently, Mr. Ayman is working as petroleum engineer section head in Petrodara Transit Loop GV in Egypt. He worked before as senior PCB field supervisor for Al Khurafi Company in Kuwait. His area of experience are his areas in, of experience are in production operations and optimization, compilation, artificial lifting, mainly sucker road, uh, progressive cavity pumping, well management, testing, and well surveillance. Is, he is also one of the PCP Tracker Software Developing Team. Thank you, Mr. Ayman, for accepting our invitation today. And now you can start your presentation. Thank you very much, Romy, for your introduction. And thanks to all who are behind the scenes. And I would like to say hello to everyone who is joining us in our, in our webinar today. Uh, and. Um, uh, our webinar today, inshallah, will be about progressive cavity pumping. Uh, I hope uh, the webinar at your knowledge and help you in your future careers. As you know, this is going to be uh, around one hour uh, session, so definitely it's not going to be enough to say everything about PCB. But I promise all of you, inshallah, you will get a solid background and those who would be interested to go deep in PCB they found all the doors open so they can go and set an introduction to general artificial lifting systems and we will focus on the PCB history uh, advantages and disadvantages we will also talk about the system components in a kind of detail uh, you want every one of you to understand the types and the components and the functions of each and every component. Then we will talk about some, some basics, about the bombing principle. Uh, then we will go to design and we'll see the design steps. And I have picked some screenshots for you from a real system design. We will discuss together and pick out the most, the most important tips. Then we will go to installation and I will highlight the most critical part in the installation. Then we will talk quickly about one of the most failures or troubles and we'll see how can we detect the trouble and, and solve the problem. Actually, PCB is driven from the helical gear pumping concept, which was first invented in the 1920s. At the time, pumps were, were used as in many industries. Then around 40 years back, maybe in the 1980s, PCB started to be seen for the first time in the oil field as an artificial lifting system. So this will drive us to an important question. When do we need artificial lift? Actually, a well will be needed to put on artificial lifting if the reservoir pressure, or let's be more precise, the bottom hole flowing pressure. If the bottom hole flowing pressure is unable to lift the formation fluids from the formation and up to the surface with the surface pressure enough to reach the production facility. In this case, the well will be known as a dead well. If we want to put this 
in a kind of formula, it will be the hydrostatic pressure plus the surface pressure plus the anticipated losses will be more than the bottom hole flowing pressure. The second case where we need artificial lifting is if the well is already producing naturally, but we need to increase the productivity of the well. And as you know, there are several types of artificial lifting systems. Gas lift, electrical submersible pumps, reciprocating rod pumps or sucker rod pumps, and so on. And actually, the mechanism of all artificial lifting systems can be summarized in this formula where gas lift is working on the hydrostatic pressure. Gas is, in check, gas is injected, so the hydrostatic pressure of the new mixture will be less than the original hydrostatic pressure. So the BWF will be now able to lift the fluids up to the surface. Other mechanical pumps, other mechanical artificial lift, lifting systems, I mean, will be working on the PWF, the bottom hole flowing pressure. They reduce the bottom hole flowing pressure at the bomb intake in front of the formation so that they can increase the drawdown of fluids from the formation to the well bore. And then they increase the bottom hole flowing pressure again at the bomb discharge to beat the hydrostatic pressure and the anticipated losses and can reach the surface with enough pressure to reach the process or the facility. This will drive us to another important question. So why do we use PCB or what can the PCB do more than other artificial lifting systems? Handling high viscous fluids. I can tell you that PCB is the best artificial lifting system that can handle high viscous and low API flows. I had some wells running and producing 10 API flows. You cannot imagine how viscous it is. It's just as viscous as grease. That was a real nightmare when, when those wells were running using sucker root bumps. Failures were every day and night, but PCBs worked efficiently and reduced those wells. Sand handling. Again, PCB proves to be the best artificial lifting system that can handle fluids with high sand cuts. And when we talk about sand, we don't only mean the formation sand, but also we can refer to the hydraulic fracturing job sands or problems. Because after fracturing jobs, fluids with high sand cuts are, are, all, are mostly expected. No valves, no reciprocating parts. The leaking valves damaged broken, broken seats and holes, damaged mechanical parts, as we can see in those photos, those types of failures are not there in the PCB. As we will see later, it simply consists of two parts with no any moving parts. As you know, petroleum industry is still a business where economics come at the first stage. And also with the, within the last few years with the drop in oil price, everyone is looking for cost reduction and PCB is doing very well in this field as it has a low capital cost. I can tell you that to produce a certain volume of fluid, the cost of a full PCB system will be around 60% of the cost of a sucker road pumping system to produce the same volume of fluid. 
Also, the BCB has a lower power consumption due to the constant load, unlike the sucker road pump, which has variating load between the upstroke and the downstroke. Also, ESPs will require high voltage and high power consumption. So PCB acts very well and need lower power consumption. In a case of new well, the design will be based on the early log expectations. So in this case, let's say the design is based to produce 1,000 barrels per day. But if the results came disappointing, PCB is very flexible to adapt to the new conditions. And its assembly can be uh, adjusted to produce at the, low, at the new lower rate with a simple operation, as we will see later. This is in regard of the production rate. But if we talk about the elastomer selection, PCB is not going to forgive you for the bad selection. The BCB also has a large surface profile, which will be suitable for the high sensitive areas and the offshore locations. Also, it can be applicable in the deviated and horizontal wells. And also it offers a high overall system efficiency, which may reach 75% or even more. The same as any other artificial lifting systems, there are also limitations and disadvantages. The first will be the limited production rate. Theoretically, the, the maximum production rate that can be achieved using a progressive cavity bomb is around 5,000 birds, which make it still far from some other systems as ESP or gas lift, where you can easily go far above uh, 15,000 and even more. The second disadvantage will be the seating depth. The maximum theoretical depth will be around 10,000 feet. And I believe this is going to be full of challenges. And it might be impossible because, as we will see later, PCB will have a sucker rod string. And the more deep you go, the more load you will have on the surface. And due to the rubber element the PCB has, it's very sensitive to high temperatures and the aromatic content. However, in this regard, some new technologies in the PCB are now existing. There are uh, some types called the all metal PCBs or metal to metal, where there is no any rubber element anymore and it's replaced with the metal elast with the metal tape. And finally, the BCB will request or will require a workover rig or polling unit for replacement in cases of failure. And to be honest, PCB is very common with sucker root bomb and they can be categorized together as medium production rate producers. We are talking at the range of 5,000 barrels per day as a maximum. So most of the comparisons that will come later, you will find it mainly compared to sucker rod bumps. Now let's go with the PCB components. And we will classify the components as surface components and downhole components. Let's start with the surface components. Number one, is the, the electric panel. They are also known as VFDs or VSDs, variable frequency drives uh, or variable speed drives. The function of the electric panel is to protect the motor against any power source disturbance. And also it provides power consumption optimization and enables to control the motor speed and consequently the bombing speed. And also, it's very easy 
to reduce and increase the speed simply by turning this adjustable key left and right. Again, it can help you to monitor the well pumping parameters. I mean the pumping speed, the road torque, and the motor current. Those are very important in well surveillance. The second component will be the drive head. The function of the drive head is to suspend the road load and the full axial loads and to transmit the rotary motion from the motor to the polished road and prevent leakage of loads through the stuffing box. And also it provides safe release of the stored energy in cases of shutdown through this brake system. We will go in detail in this section. The, the drive heads in this photo are of direct drive type where they deploy electrical motors. This one is called a single drive head and this one is a dual drive head. It uses two motors to provide more horsepower for high torque applications. Some other types will use hydraulic motors and those will be known as hydraulic drive heads. Now let's go to the components of the drive head itself. Each drive head must, must have some means to, transport, to transmit the rotary motion from the motor sheave to the drive head sheave which is connected to the polished road. The system can be sheaves and belts, as this one, or it can be gear transmission system. The, sec the second component of the drive head is the thrust bearing. The function of the bearing is to enable rotation while suspending the full loads. Brake system. This is very critical and very important component. Why? Because during the normal operation, energy is stored in the road stream in the form of torsionality and the fluid potential energy. In case of shadows, shadows were planned for maintenance or unplanned like trips and falls, the stored energy will be suddenly released. This will cause the rotor and the rod string and the drive head to rotate in the reverse direction at high speed. If this is uncontrolled, it makes the rod string to be backed off or may cause equipment damage at this in, the, in this photo, or it can even cause personal injury. The stuffing box. The last component in the drive head, the function of the stuffing box is to provide seal against the polished road using those rubber elements and to prevent leakage of loads. Let's go back to the surface components and the last one is the composite POB. The function of the composite POB is to provide connection to the flow line through this port and also it enables to secure the well for maintenance work. Those rams are closed to seal against the bullish road and then the well is secure for any maintenance works. The composite BOB is placed just below the drive head. So, as a summary, the surface components will be the electric panel, the drive head, and the composite POB. Now, let's go to the downhole components and we will start with the rod string. The first will be conventional steel rods, then fiberglass rods, then continuous rods. Those are known commercially as co-rods. Those are the types of the rod strings available today in the market. Conventional steel sucker rods are the most commonly used. 
they are manufacturing using different alloys and different grades to suit different environments. Like the ABI grades, grade C will be suitable for, for low loads. Grade K will be suitable for cruisive inf environments. Grade D will be suitable for high loads. There are also non-ABI grades like the EL and the 96 and the 97 and the HS. Those are manufactured to suit some more advanced applications. The EL, for example, will suit the high torque PCB applications. The, the, uh, the HS will be manufacturing to suit the high loads, most main, or mainly in the sucker load applications. The steel sucker loads are also manufactured in different sizes, starting from 5 eighths of an inch and going up to an inch and quarter. The standard lengths of conventional steel rods is 25 feet or 30 feet. So, the four rod string will now consist of a polished rod at the surface, full length sucker rods, pony rods, and couplings. Polished rod is also steel rod and has a smooth polished surface to provide hard seal against the rubber element of the stuffing box and prevent fluid leakage. Pony rods are manufactured in the same and in the same sizes of the full length straight rods, as we just said. Couplings are used to connect the rods and the pony rods together. So polished rod will be at the then mixture of full length and pony rods connected together with the coupling and ending at the bottom end with the rotor. And we will see a full sketch later. Then the last component and the heart of the system actually, the downhole bomb itself. As you can see, it simply consists of only two parts, the rotor and the stator. The rotor is the helically, helically machined piece of steel and covered with crew, while the stator consists of a steel tube and elastomer rubber, and they are bonded together using bonding material. Let's know how to identify a PCB. If you check any PCB, you will find the serial number on the stator, the same as that one. The first two digits, which is 98 here, refer to the bump capacity or the bump displacement. So the 98 here means this bump can produce 98 cubic meters per day per 100 RBM. This means if this bump is running at 200 RBMs, this bump will be able to displace or produce 196 barrels per day. And this is assuming 100% efficiency. The next four digits, 1800, those refer to the pump pressure development ability of that pump or the net lift. So here the 1800 means this pump can lift the flow 1800 meters where you can easily convert this value to a pressure value. The next few digits, those are representing the stator serial number. Well, the next our rotor serial number. Serial numbers are very important to record and monitor the history and the performance of each pump. The last few digits refer to the stator elastomer type. All what we have mentioned, those were the essential system components. They will be existing in every progressive cavity pumping system. In addition to those, some more accessories can be added to provide more 
or additional functions. The first will be the tubing drain or tubing drain valve. In many cases, the rotor may get stuck inside the stator. In this situation, the tubing will be full of fluids up to the surface. If the boiling unit or the workover rig proceed to pull out the bomb, in this situation, all the fluids will come up to the surface and it will be a mess on the rig floor. To avoid this situation, we need to dump the tubing fluid inside the casing tubing annulus. And to achieve this, we need to have a tubing drain valve installed. The one that you see in this photo is the hydraulic tubing drain. This leaf originally were fixed here and cover the holes and fix it to the body of the tubing drain using shear pins. Those shear pins are pre-designed to shear at certain pressure. Once this pressure is exceeded, the shear pins get broken and the sleeve slides down or downwards over the body of the tubing drain. And thus, the holes are now connecting the tubing string to the annulus and dumping the flip. The next accessory is the null turn tool. In the normal operation, the rotor will be rotating in the clockwise direction inside the stator, as we will see later. And the tubing, there will be some probability that the tubing will rotate in the same direction. This will cause unscrew for the, for the tubing string, which is not needed. So in order to hold the tubing, we use the no turn tool to hold the tubing string inside the casing walls using those slits. So those slits hold the tubing against the casing inside walls. The no turn tool is normally installed just below the PCB stator. Tubing drain, by the way, should be installed just above the, the PCB stator, but just maybe one or two joints above the stator because there must be one tubing joint just above the PCB stator for handling. Then the tubing drain, if no downhold sensor is used, if downhold sensor is used, it may be the tubing drain will be one more joint above the downhold sensor. Gas separator. Using gas separator will be important in cases like wells having high GOR and free gas exists extensive, intensively inside at the pump free, intensively at the pump intake. The gas separator will help to get the gas separated before it enters the pump intake as the centrifugal force will repel the, the gas out from this port to the annulus while the fluid continues to the pump intake. Gas separator will be installed below the no turn tool. Rod centralizers. I would say those will be mandatory in deviated and horizontal woods. The function of rod centralizers is to keep the rod string centralized inside the tubing string and to keep the couplings away from the tubing inside the wall. Neglecting the rod centralizers or mess design will definitely lead to premature rod and tubing string failures. And downhole sensors. Downhole sensors are mainly used to provide live data about the bottom hole conditions. I mean the discharge pressure and temperature, the intake pressure and temperature, 
and the vibration in the three directions x, y, and z. Downhole sensors existence is very useful in well monitoring and surveillance and is very useful also in troubleshooting. They can also be connected with the electrical panel to provide control and to protect the bump against being bumped off. And pump off condition means the bump is running dry. In this case, the rotor will be rotating inside the stator with no cooling from the float. So the friction will raise the temperature and the bump will get damaged. So connecting downhole sensors to the electrical panel allow the panel to automatically reduce the speed if the intake pressure reduced below a certain value. And then it can increase again the speed if this value is exceeded or increased, I mean. Now, let's see how it works. As we mentioned, this is a drive head and this is a motor. This is the polished road passing through the stuffing box and the composite VOB. This is the casing string. This is the tubing string. And this is the rod string. And here is our downhole PCV rotor. This is the stator. This is the elastomer. Now let's switch on the system from the electrical panel. So the electric motor will be rotating and driving the rod string to rotate in the clockwise. And also rotating the rotor in the clockwise direction inside the stator. And this will move the fluid from one cavity to the next in the upward direction. Now, let's talk about some basics about the PCV to understand more how it works. The first will be the loop ratio. Loop ratio is the ratio of rotor loops to stator loops. And the stator will always have a loop more than one. The first one to, in the left is the one to two ratio, loop ratio, where the rotor has one loop and the stator has two loops. The one at the right is the two to three. The rotor has two loops, while the stator has three loops. Eccentricity. Eccentricity is half the distance between the rotor minor diameter and the stator center line. Again, this is the stator center line. And this is the rotor minor diameter. And this is the rotor major diameter. The stator center line minus the rotor minor center line and the divided by two, this is the eccentricity. Pitch length. The stator pitch length will always be double the rotor pitch length. Let's see how this affects. Pumps with low eccentricity and long stator pitch will be suitable more for pumping and having higher API and lower viscosity and more water cut. While pumps with high eccentricity and small pitch length will be more suitable to bump high viscous fluids and high thin. Pump displacement. 
You remember the 98? Now let's see how it comes. The bump displacement is the result of multiplying the rotor minor diameter by the eccentricity value by dictator. Those will be multiplied by a constant. So this will be the bump displacement cubic meters per day per, per RPM. To calculate the flow rate, we have just to multiply it by number of revolutions per minute, the RPM. So this is how the bump displacement is calculated. The pressure seal lines. Pressure seal lines are formed by the physical contact between the rotor and the stator. They are always existing as long as the bump is running, and they are deformed by the differential pressure across the bump. As the differential pressure increase across the bump, the pressure seal lines will be deformed, and the bump pressure development will be less. Now, let's talk about the system design. At the beginning, let's talk about the target of the design. Actually, our target is to select all the system components that will achieve the target production rate while maintaining optimum performance component and acceptable run life. What do I mean by optimum performance? I mean that none of the components should be overloaded. For example, the downhole pump, it has pressure rating. If this pressure rating is exceeded, certainly the pump will have a premature failure. Also the road strength, the grade, each grade has certain maximum shouldn't it like it's unlogic to say okay let's install 200 so we have to achieve all this while stay within the economical limits it's unlogic to say okay we will install a very big drive head 150 horsepower and a very big one 200 series to produce thousand barrels per day the mom will produce the thousand barrels per day but it will be a full waste of money. Remember that cost reduction is still chasing us. In order to get a successful design, a set of accurate data will be available. The first will be regarding the well bore geometry. We need to know this well is vertical or deviated or horizontal. If it's deviated or horizontal, we will need the deviation survey results to locate the severe dog leg spots. And also we will not, we'll need to know the casing size and grade and ID and depth. If there is a liner, we will need to know the top of liner depth, the ID. And then we will need the production conditions. We will need to know the target production rate, of course and we need to know the bottom hole flowing pressure. And if the well has a producing history, we will need to know the dynamic fluid level and the intake pressure. Also, we need to know the fluid properties to be produced. We need to know the oil API, the water cut, sand cut. We need to know the H2S content, the aromatic content. So all, all these data must be available and accurate in order to get a successful design. For the softwares, there are not so many design softwares for PCB, and CFAIR is the most commonly used. And I, as I said, I have some screenshots from a real design. We will discuss later. Before we discuss, we just need to talk about the elastomer selection. This topic is actually very important and I consider it as a secret behind a successful design. At the beginning of any project, the pump supplier or manufacturer must get 
fluid samples from the wells that will be operated using the PCBs. And each manufacturer has certain types of elastomers. The fluid elastomer compatibility test is done by immersing specimens from the elastomers, from the different types of elastomer, in the collected fluid samples. And those are placed in tubes. Then those tubes are placed in a device called the autoclave. This autoclave will simulate the downhole pressure and temperature. And the samples are kept there for three days. Sometimes it's kept for seven days in some tests. Then the samples are taken out to measure the change in volume. Then we collect all the results together for evaluation. Like in that example, we have elastomer A, elastomer B, and elastomer C. According to the results, the elastomer B should be selected because it has the least change in volume. This means the elastomer A and the elastomer C, if they, were, if they are immersed in the fluid in the bottom hole conditions, elastomer A will get swollen by 12% and elastomer C will get swelled by 9%. So B is the winner. The fluid elastomer compatibility test should be done for every well or field, depending on how common, property, common properties they have. And even for the, the same well, sometimes with, the life, with, with time during the well life, the properties get changed. So in this case, the test has to be repeated with every considerable change in properties. This photo is a very famous failure of stator elastomers, where the elastomer get severely swelled, as you see in the photo. The direct cause here may be exposure to high temperatures or some aromatic content. But I would say that the root cause was the improper elastomer selection or inaccurate test. So the elastomer selection is very, very important in design. Now, let's go to CFAIR. We'll start with the data input section. In the wellbore well geometry tab, we will be entering the wellbore survey results. Then, in the equipment configuration, we will be trying to use different configurations. For, for example, we'll start with the drive. We are inserting here the model and brand of drive head, the motor horsepower, the chief ratio, and all the stuff. Then in the casing section, we will be inserting data about the casing size and the depth and the ID. The same for tubing, we'll put the tubing size and depth. In the rod string, we'll be putting our configuration of the rod string. And here we should be inserting the bump seating depth and the perforation depth. And here we'll be inserting the pump data. And to be clear, the fluid properties and the operating conditions are fixed parameters where we have to adapt to. But we only playing with those equipment as a kind of try and error. As the designer's experience increase, he may get the final optimum design and system and all components configuration from the first run, or at least the number of trials will not be that much. Let's continue with the fluid properties. In this tab, we will be putting the water cut, the sand cut, the oil gravity, the fluid viscosity. In the operating conditions, we have to insert the target production rate 
and the submergence. Submergence means the fluid level over the bomb. In other words, we can say it's the intake pressure. And also you'll have to insert the casing and tubing surface pressures and the bottom hole flowing temperature. Now we are ready to run. And these are the results. Remember that we need to confirm that none of the components is overloaded or overrated. For example, the bomb pressure loading. It's 83%. To me, it looks a little high, but it's still good. The road torque here is 266. We will have to revise our configuration and see what grade of the road we have chosen and see the maximum torque for this grade. But don't worry, 266 is still a low value, so it will be good. And here the rod tubing load contact loads is zero, which is very good. The thrust bearing life, 18 years, very, very good. And the mo surface motor loading is 20%. To me, this 20% may indicate that we may use or try a smaller motor. And the overall volume system efficiency is 32%. That's because the motor is underloaded. So if we selected another motor of less horsepower, we can increase the overall system efficiency. Now the system design is over and we are ready for installation. And let's start with the stator installation. As we mentioned before, the conventional PCB consists of stator and rotor. The stator is always attached and installed as, as an integral part of the tubing string, while the rotor is run on the rod string. Some other configurations like the insert pump, the both the rotor and the stator are installed on the rod string. Some other configurations like the ES PCBs, the electrical submersible PCBs, the stator is run with the tubing string and attached to a downhole motor. Those types do not need sucker rods since the motor is attached to the downhole bump. The same as ESP with an electric cable running to the surface. Let's go back to the most common PCBs, which is the conventional PCB. As we said, installation will start with the tubing string and the stator attached to the tubing. And this is a typical sketch for tubing string. Let's start from the bottom. We will find the gas separator and then the no tool, the no turn tool or the torque anchor, then the tag bar, then the PCB stator, and here notice that we are mentioning the serial number of the stator. This is very important to mention the size and the type and serial number of each and every part running into the well. This is very important in cases of troubleshooting and fishing. So, and even to, to record the history of that pump. Let's continue. Above the stator, you'll find the bob joint. This is used for handling the rotor then the downhole sensor, and then the tubing drain valve, and then tubing joints to the surface, and the count of those will detect and deter determine the bump seating depth. After the stator installation ends, the rotor installation starts. And as we said, the rotor is attached to the bottom of the rod string. So at first we will run the rotor and then continue running sucker rods from the surface till the rotor reaches, reaches the top of stator. And here the most critical part in an installation starts, which is the rotor space out operation. Let's see this animation. Now we are running sucker rods from the surface and the rotor is going down. 
At that point, the rotor reaches the top of stator. At that time, you should notice little drop of in the sucker rod weight on the rig Martin Decker or weight indicator. Now the rotor will start to go through the stator. And notice that you should be running slower while the rotor is inside the stator. Then we will continue to run till we reach, till the rotor reaches the tag bar, this black dot. At that point, the weight indicator will continue to drop till it reaches zero. Whenever it reaches zero, this means that the full rod string weight is now resting on the tag bar. Now we will have to space out the rotor. What is the meaning of space out? Space out means that we need to locate the rotor at a certain position inside the If the rotor is placed below that position, there is a probability that the rotor will be touching the tag bar. In this case, the pump will be running at higher torque. There will be high potential to get rod and the tubing string failures, and the pump might be get damaged. Okay, so what about if we place the rotor above this position? Can you remember the pressure seal lines? That's exactly what will happen. We will lose pressure seal lines, and consequently, we will lose some of the pump pressure development capability. Efficiency, efficiency will be less, and thus we will be losing production. So, space out is to locate the rotor exactly at the desired position. Let's see how we will do it. Now, the rotor is fully resting on the tag bar, the rig Martin Decker is showing zero weight and the rotor space out will start. We will need to lift the rotor for two distances. The first distance will be the slack weight distance and the second distance is a certain value. The slack weight distance, we will pick up the rotor till on the Martin Decker read, we read the same original rod weight just before the rotor tags on the tag bar or rest on the tag bar. And the second value is a pre-known value for each pump brand and model. Again, rotor space out is the sum, is the sum of two values. The first is a slack weight distance, and the second is a pre-known value for each pump model. Let's see how this will happen. Now the rotor is resting on the tag bar, so we will start with picking up the rotor for the distance equivalent to the slack weight where we will get the original rod string weight on the Martin Decker at the rig floor. Now we started to pick up the rotor and here we got the full rod string weight and now we are lifting the rotor for the extra distance which is pre-known for each brand. I think it's clear now. After rotor installation, this will be a typical rotor installation sketch. We will see the rotor at the bottom end and remember to put the serial number and then a mixture of steel, full, full length steel rods and pony rods and cobbling connect, connectors and then the polished rod placed at the top. The sketch should have the size, the depth and the length and the quantity of each component. After the rotor installation is completed, we are now ready to install the drive head at the surface and the polished rod clamp. Before we end up with the installation, I would like to refer to the importance to follow and strictly follow the standard 
storage, handling, transportation, and makeup procedures of sucker rods. This is very important to prevent the premature failures of sucker rods. You can refer to API number 11BR for more details about the recommended practices for the sucker rod. And troubleshooting. One of the very famous failures in PCB is when you get a phone call from the production operator and tells you that the PCB, a PCB well has stopped and the panel is reading an over torque fault. What happened here is the electric panel has stopped the well because the motor is running at higher current. And the higher current because the motor is facing higher rod torque. And the higher rod torque is because the rotor is now rotating harder inside the, the stator. And actually, this rise in torque is not always sudden. And in many cases, it's gradual over, an hour, over hours or maybe days. And if this is catched or caught, if this is caught by the monitoring team, this will help to solve the problem earlier before it gets to a complicated stuck scenario. But anyhow, in this case, we will proceed and do a flush job. The purpose of, or the steps of the, flush, of the flush job is to get the rotor out of the stator, free the stuck and get it out, and then flush the tubing string and the stator with a certain volume of flush fluid, and then return the rotor back in its location. The flush fluid volume should be one and a half the tubing string capacity. Now let's see this animation. Now we are bumping from the surface and filling the tubing string. And in most cases, the sand will be settling at the top of the stator. That's why now no more fluids coming, but we are pressurizing out the, the uh, tubing and try to push the sediments or the sand away. And now we succeeded and fluid is now moving inside the stator and it start to flow inside the casing annulus. There are some precautions to be taken while making flushing jobs. The first is a back spin. Once the stuck rotor gets free, it's very expected to have a severe back spin. I know there is brake system, but you must take your caution. There might be failure in the brake system. You must protect your personnel and equipment. The, the reason behind this severe backspin is that in the stuck condition, the tubing is full of fluid and the discharge pressure was higher than the intake pressure. So once the rotor gets free and gets out of the stator, now the hydrostatic pressure will be equalizing the intake pressure in the annulus. So this will be driving the rotor to rotate very fast inside the stator in the backward direction. The second precaution is the flush fluid. Remember that you have a rubber elastomer in the well. So never use diesel and the flush fluid must be compatible with the well fluids. At the end, I don't want to in this webinar before we even talk quickly about test bench. Test bench is used to evaluate the performance of PCBs. It consists of an electric panel, a drive head which is set horizontally to suit the bump shop locations, and a closed fluid system operated with heater the heater will simulate the downhole temperature 
And also it's equipped with adjustable choke to create pack pressure against the bomb discharge. And there is also flow meter to detect the rate and pressure sensor and temperature sensor. Normally we, we do test, we do bench tests for the bump after they are pulled out to evaluate the performance of those pumps and help to make the decision either those pumps can be used again or they should be scrapped as junk. That the bench test is normally done at several speeds, normally 100, 200, and 300. And at different steps of back pressure, those steps will depend on the maximum pressure rating, the maximum pressure rating. And at the end, I would like to thank all of you and all your questions are more than welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ayman, for your uh, interesting presentation today. Uh, really, we have learned a lot from it. And it seems that we have some questions. Uh, the first one from Zakaria, it says that uh, in the case of sand in slows, does this have an effect on the performance of the bump? Um, performance, if he means uh, efficiency, I would say no. And remember that uh, keeping producing sand is still a very good advantage that you can never achieve with any other artificial lifting system. So producing uh, will continue, efficiency will not be that much affected by the presence of sands or salt. The only thing that you have to take care about in cases of shutdowns, like I just said, those sediments and sand will, will settle at once. So the flush jobs are also preferred to be done in, in cases of planned shutdowns even to prevent the stuck situation. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. The second question, uh, uh, is it always the case that the PCP is run after hydraulic cracking? Yes or no? Uh, it's not a must, but it's still a very good option. Like I said, after fracture, Jobs is very expected to receive loads with high sand cuts. You can uh, you can still uh, operate with sucker load bump, and you will you will be lucky if it, it it's not it's not getting uh, damaged or stuck. But PCBs, if it's run, for sure, inshallah, there will be no any problem, and it will get the sand up. If okay, uh, the last question. Uh... Uh, can we run new PCB models in high pressure, high temperature wells? What is the maximum temperature limitation for these updated PCBs? Yeah, I, I had PCBs running at um, 450 degree, uh, degrees Fahrenheit in a field which was operated and where uh, that field was steam injected. So that the bottom hole temperature exceeded the 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the all metal PCBs uh, are there. It's a new technology. It's not uh, very recent, but it's there and it's functioning properly. And uh, if he is very interested in this field, uh, there are so many researches and papers in this field. But what I can say right now, the all metal PCBs will be working efficiently with temperature, no issue. Uh, okay, thank you, Doctor. It looks like we have covered uh, most of the questions. Uh, Dr. Ayman, uh, is there is anything else you want to cover before wrap up? Uh, I'm done. I just want I need to highlight that uh, my contact info are there in the first slide. Uh, all uh, questions will be more than welcome. I promise to get back and respond to all your questions at the earliest. And thanks to all the attendees.
Okay, uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, Greet. Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time and we appreciate uh, you, Dr., uh, for accepting our invitation. And thanks, and hope to see you in our next lectures in Trova.